So, after dinner dip, or, um, sorry, after lunch dip, or are we all good? Yeah, yeah because we have two more very interesting uh, uh, presentations from uh, two customers. Uh, and the first one is from Logias. And um, maybe when we talk about digital innovation and digital transformation, your first thoughts are not about the Dutch government. But let you uh, uh, let be uh, surprised because actually they are very innovative. So uh, I would like to invite uh, Hans Bot, the uh, one of the uh, lead senior architect uh, currently at Logius, um, and uh, Hans will tell a complete different story, not so much about technology, but more about the governance and and and. Uh, what if you apply biostandards? I am not sure if everybody knows what the biostandards are, but it is a highly uh, secured standard for mainly government bodies like uh, Logius. Um, Marcel, oh, so, sorry, you also brought uh, Marcel with you. Uh, Marcel, oh, over there. He will not be on stage, but uh, Marcel is uh, also from Logius and uh, available for questions which uh, Hans is not able to answer, or Marcel is actually more accurate to answer. So Marcel, thank you so much for, for joining. Uh, Hans is uh, a, a well-known person in the Netherlands. He is one of the founders of the architectural uh, forum and architectural uh, uh, clubs. And for the past how many years you are now with Jenlo? Like seven and a half. Seven and a half years, and a long time uh, a time of that seven and a half years at, uh, at Logia. So Hans, uh, the floor is yours Yes. and surprise us. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm guessing it's not too often that you meet a human bot. Here I am. And uh, if I understand Ruben correctly, I should keep innovating myself, otherwise I'm going to be outcompeted by an AI bot uh, Soon. So let's see if I can uh, um, surprise you indeed with uh, some new and novel ideas. Um, I am today here the, uh, as the proud product owner uh, of the authentication and API management platform. Yes, Asanka, we built our own platform. Sorry for that. <laughs> At <coughs> um, Logius. Um, if you are in the Netherlands, uh, Logius is not a terribly well known name, but you most definitely know our products. Um, I've heard mentioned this morning uh, about DigiDay already. That's one of our products. And uh, one of the other products is called Mijn Overheid, My Government. And this is the place, talking about data, uh, Ruben, where you, as a Dutch citizen, can find all the information the Dutch government has on you. And when you think about that, all the information is managed in all kinds of different entities. So there is an incredible lot of integration going on there. Um, Ruben was already talking about uh, uh, after lunch dip. I know that many speakers who are the first uh, slot after lunch uh, uh, find an excuse, so to say. <coughs> uh, uh, if you dip away a little bit, I'm not going to do that because I have, I think, a better excuse talking about security. That's not uh, everybody's favorite hobby, right? It's, uh, it's often painful. But you can imagine that uh, if you bring information about citizens together, security is more than a little bit important. I mean, yes, I like to know what the government knows about me, but I don't want my neighbor to know everything uh, about my personal financial affairs and but my properties, my education, so that, there is so much information the government has on you. Um, and it is, I, I think personally, it is a good thing that they are fully transparent towards a citizen. Hey, dear citizen, this is what we have on you. And if there is something wrong, please inform us, then we can correct it, right? 
Um, and this is all in, in one place. Very, very, very convenient. Um, security is also not my favorite hobby. Uh, let me uh, uh, be, be frank about that. <clears throat> but what I do like as an architect, <coughs> as an architect, sorry, is take away the pain of security. That is driving me. So yes, security is important. This is terribly important, in fact. But it doesn't need to be so painful. And what I want to talk about today is how we are thinking about implementing security in a way that it is not painful at all. Isn't that exciting? No? <laughs> OK. First of all, BIO. I, uh, I assume that not everybody uh, fully knows what BIO stands for. Uh, in the Dutch government, it is quite well known. It stands for baseline information security. Information security overheid, government. So in little translation in, uh, in English, what would be BIG. Uh, and yes, it is quite big. Um, information, this is actually enacted in a, in a law. Every government entity has to comply to the BO guidelines. Um, it's mainly setting norms. You have to do a privacy uh, assessment, you have to assess the risk, you have to define controls, etc., etc., etc. Things we know from other frameworks, like for instance, ETIL. Um, but what makes it a little bit special is that they go the next step. Uh, ISO uh, 27002 is doing the same thing. Um, yes, you have to uh, define your processes carefully, you have to document them, uh, you have to uh, explain how you are in control. Next step is, now prove me that you did it, and you did it all the way, and you <laughs> didn't just do it uh, uh, right before the audit. But if I want to ask you about three months ago, you should al also be able to prove that you were in control three months ago. And what um, the magic word there is, is an um, information security management system. An ISMS, it's a concept, but you have to collect information about information security, about how you are in control throughout all, all the time. <coughs> Um, for me, this is a source of inspiration. It drives me to think about how we can embrace this and embrace this in a way that it is compliant and not a big nuisance. I, uh, in the uh, upper right corner, made a little logo for, for bio compliancy. You will see it throughout the slides in, uh, in places where it is relevant from a uh, baseline information security perspective. So, <coughs> um, one or two words about the, the structure of my talk. And this is something that reminds me of something I learned uh, quite a few moons ago. Um, and that was about building trust. And they explained me back then, Hans, um, in many organizations there is a trust crisis, but actually building trust is very, very simple. What you simply need to do is make a promise, fulfill the promise, and prove that you have fulfilled the promise. And many, many people just do the, fir the first two steps and f forget about the third. And then you don't build the trust. 
if you want to build trust, you have to go all the way. So this is also uh, an inspiration for me on, on how I structure this talk. First, making the promise, making a design, how are we going to secure the system? Um, then I'm talking a little bit about how we implemented it, and now we are in a stage that we are collecting proof. So that's the, um, the last part. A couple of things. Um, Logis is a big and a complex organization. Um, uh, I, I don't know everything about Logis. I'm not going to claim that. Um, but for the part I know a thing or two, the main override part uh, I told you about, um, we have a couple of simple design principles. Um, and this one is an important one. And the way Logis works is maybe also a bit innovative. These kinds of principles are embedded in uh, any tender process they are doing. Dear suppliers, never mind your ideas. These are our principles. Please comply. Um, very abstract picture. Could probably talk uh, uh, all afternoon about it, and especially if we go more in detail. Image is very simple. We want to embrace a microservice architecture. We have microservices. Microservices can communicate uh, 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 across each other or between each other uh, through events. We are actually using Kafka as an event bus. Um, but to the outside world, everything goes over an API. My perspective, security perspective, if I can control the API access, I'm pretty much in control of security. Not all details, uh, but if, if you can make it there, <laughs> uh, then you're already a, a long way. Um, Asanka was talking about the cell-based architecture, didn't put it in here, but yes, we have multiple products. Uh, every product uh, is uh, assigned to one, perhaps two teams, and runs in its own namespace. The namespace um, uh, implements the cell concept in the cell-based architecture. That's quite nice. Uh, and for your information, is Asanka still here? Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, we are uh, uh, implementing the micro gateway, Corio Connect, uh, for the east west traffic and the traditional API gateway for the north south traffic. That's part of the, uh, the, the setup and a core part of the platform. Uh, and in this, each and every namespace will have its own instance of uh, uh, the micro gateway, of course. So that's one. No excuse. Everything is accessed over APIs, and there is no resource that you can access otherwise. Two. I uh, I wrote a blog. I think four five years ago maybe about making APIs inherently secure. Uh, it was one of the best red blocks uh, that, that year. So uh, I think I touched uh, something. <clears throat> and I, I think it is still pretty important. Um, what I mean with inherently secure APIs is that um, uh, you typically don't want to expose anything to the outside world where you can easily meddle with. Um, simple example, there are many uh, uh, examples like that. Um, if you want to access information on my government, there is an API uh, which says my information. You cannot identify yourself, there is no ID whatsoever, you can just get your information. 
And of course, internally, it will be translated uh, because you are authenticated through DigiD. We know your BSN, which is the Dutch ID, but we know it from the JSON Web Token. We don't ask it uh, in the interface of the API. Um, this is a thing that's called broken object level authentication, if I remember correctly. Uh, the BOLA acronym, uh, at least. If you think about it up front, it's often very easy to circumvent those kinds of uh, issues in your API definition. Just one example. Strict API definitions is about more than that. It's about, well, in, if, if you uh, define your API, it's an, an ideal moment to think about what input am I actually expecting? Uh, define a regular expression, define a, a minimum number of uh, rays, uh, sorry, er rows in an array. <laughs> uh, sorry for stumbling a little bit. Um, uh, details like that, I call it hardening your API. And if you do that design time, it is very easy to secure your API later. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and what you see here, uh, uh, at least what I try to convey, is that if you want to do the uh, security, there are a lot of roles involved. I have here the, the developer role about these definitions, but also an API owner about subscriptions, for instance, uh, the subscriber setting up uh, access control for his applications, uh, and some kind of a principal who has to establish some guidelines and security practices, etc., platform policies. So it is a, a collaboration to make your uh, APIs secure. Third principle, APIs must be well governed. Um, and how we think about that is that in the life cycle of an API, there are particular events and when such an event happens, we want to have some controls in place. Um, looking at the time, not, uh, not enough time to go into any detail. Um, but what we have uh, made up, designed, is for each of those workflows, um, what roles should be involved, in what capacity, and um, what is their responsibility, basically. Um, Marcel is obviously, because he's the security officer, concerned with everything. So he will be informed about every decision made in the uh, life cycle of an API. <laughs> that was a little bit about the design. Then, implementation. If you take away one thing from this talk, may it be this. I personally think that um, Open ID Connect scopes, OIDC scopes, as part of an API definition, are very much underappreciated. They are underappreciated because they are an easy security mechanism. They are a robust security mechanism. It's all based on standards. And it's very easy to collect the evidence. So how does it work? I, as an API designer, for different uh, parts of the entire tree of resources, I can define a scope. A scope, think about it as a permission level. S some item where you need permission for. And what happens next is that somebody should decide, in this case I call it an identity manager, uh, hey, these scopes, I, I can bind them to groups or roles or whatever, but something that, it, that I can assign to a person or to an application. That's a three-step process. And that way, I can be in control, pretty fine-grained, 
on the action level. These kinds of users, they can only, I don't know, uh, have a look at this information. I mean, uh, a citizen can have a look at his uh, financial status, I don't know. He cannot change it. That's a, a different uh, responsibility. Scopes are very, very versatile and very easy to manage because you manage them with the API definition. And you already have the mechanism to assign roles to people. That is not, nothing new. So if you tie the two together, you make it very, very easy to um, enforce the access control roles you have in identity and access management on your API gateway. That's the last step. The API gateway will very happily say, dear uh, user, you want to access an API which has this scope. Uh, this scope is not in your profile, not in your JSON web token. Sorry, you don't have any access. That's pretty watertight. So please take that away. This is almost an entirely uh, uh, separate talk. Perhaps uh, some of you uh, know that uh, we as Yenlo have a, a very uh, tight uh, partnership with a company called 42 Crunch. Um, and they have a wonder wonderful suite of products that make this possible. One suite of products that will help developers harden their API definitions. That's the first step. Uh, sorry, that's the third step. <laughs> uh, that will make sure that the API definition is the correct definition. And if you have this correct definition, it can make sure that nothing will pass uh, the firewall unless it entirely complies to the definition. See it as a contract. And the, the better you define your contract, the more um, security enforcing the contract can provide. Tip number two. <laughs> Tip number three. Um, closing all the back doors. We know that for a long time. And uh, the, the popular lingo nowadays is talking about immutable containers. At Logis, we have a containerized platform. That's also something we do ourselves. It's called the Logis Private Cloud. Yes, you can build a private cloud. And yes, Asanka, it is a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> and it is difficult. Anyhow, immutable containers, the idea is that anything you do in the deployment and configuration of your software, you do it design time. Everything is managed in Git. Everything is uh, deployed through CICD pipelines. Anything, everything is repeatable. But you can also get information, evidence, uh, from uh, your CACD pipelines much easier than uh, if you have to monitor continuously what people are doing uh, during runtime in your actual applications. What we want to do is more or less block off SSH access to our servers. We don't need that anymore. It is a vulnerability, and there is a better way. Oh, why not embrace it? Why not? What's not to like, I would say? <laughs> then uh, I have just one slide left, and that is an important one. Um, what you have seen so far is a lot of recommendations, best practices, how we should do things. Um, but that doesn't make us in control. I am not responsible for the CACD pipeline of any team. Each product owner is responsible for its own product, its own CACD pipelines. Uh, API definitions 
I can give some, uh, some guidelines, I can give some tools, I can give them a, a, a micro gateway, I can give them whatever. Still, I'm not in control. So we felt we needed some kind of a closing stone. We have all the tools, we make it possible, we have the cookbooks, we have everything in place. Now, how can we make it so that they also start embracing it? And what we don't want to do is have a, a security police. We don't want to have some kind of a, a central police bureau who has to authorize everything. We did it differently. We did it in a safe, agile way. That's the way Logis likes to work. So what we came up with is this. This is approximately how it looks. Um, I call it API governance by exception. What, um, what we have invented is a self-assessment as part uh, of the workflows we designed before. Every team is responsible for its own security. That's the shift, le shift left. Um, and in the end, the, uh, there are some checklists, there are some simple controls, um, where we ask the product owner, dear product owner, uh, you want to publish this API on a platform, have you considered uh, IDs are not easily guessable. Uh, there is no privacy uh, sensitive information, PII, uh, in the URI. Uh, uh, you have scanned your API definition with 42 crunch and the score is at least 80 out of 100. Um, you have rules about uh, authentication in your API, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A simple checklist, and if you check all the boxes, Deal is done. Only when there is an exception, comply or explain, only when there is an exception, then there is a second step in the workflow where you need permission from uh, the system architect explaining, hey, um, I don't know why, you don't want me to have uh, uh, private information in the URI, uh, I have um, a, a URL out of the box, I have to comply to, don't know, please give me permission. And then it's up to the, uh, uh, the system architect as a higher authority to approve or not. And all this information is fed into the uh, information security management system so that we have also the evidence we, we have not only um, announced the best practices, but we have also implemented them. That's uh, where we are today. Um, it is a bit of a risk we are taking. Yes, you can fool it if you are a, a, a PO and you are uh, declaring things that you actually haven't done. Time will tell if that's a problem or not. Personally, I think that uh, we should not uh, look for a technology solution to solve problems with uh, human behavior. I think that's a battle you're not going to win. Um, but let's see, uh, this is a, a now, for now it's a starting point. Um, it is something I am quite proud of. I think it keeps the agility in place, it keeps the responsibility where it belongs, but it puts security on the agenda um, and not as an afterthought, but as an integrated part of the development process. Well, Hans, um, what you didn't tell, but I will tell for you, that uh, this is the tip of the iceberg, right? Because yeah. you only had 30 minutes to explain uh, 300 pages. Uh, because I can tell personally that the bio standard is enormous. Um, it ins well, I'm a nerd, you know. <laughs> it inspired me, actually. Um, I have one question, if, if there's nobody else. Uh, at least I have one, but is there a question from somebody? There should be at least one. Did it right? make sense? Which, which tool are you using for your workflow? Uh, 
API governance. So uh, we are using uh, Kamunda as a workflow engine, and it ties into the uh, API management tooling of WSA2. So the events are triggered by uh, the, 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 the portals. Uh, or from the CSED pipelines, we very much promote that APIs are managed through the, the pipelines as well. Mm, there is very limited uh, possibility. So what, what, what we have decided is we wanted to do something more advanced. So uh, for, uh, with the uh, workflow events, uh, we call a workflow engine, in this case Kamunda, where we do the actual uh, uh, the, 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 the checking. Okay. Yeah, you had the mic now, so uh, <laughs> should be enough, another question. Uh, Steve, behind you. Oh, Hans. dear. Yeah, here dear Steve. Uh, so you get all these requests through the API. How is the data audited? How did you solve it regarding uh, following the BO guidelines? Yeah, do you uh, there's get all the kinds of data Marcel? coming through the APIs, That's and uh, how, do, how how you make sure that you're responsible, the data that you're auditing, uh, that it is according to security gui guidelines, and in which way did you solve it on your side? No, but in, in, in a more abstract way, I think, we took the security guidelines and made those checklists from them. You so no, but yeah, I mean, the data that is going through the APIs, uh, some is confidential, so how do you make sure that uh, the data is not uh, landing on the street publicly with your system? Mm, I don't think I understand the question fully, because what, what we do is Marcel, we are... Uh, can you give Marcel a mic? Hang on, uh, hang on, Marcel, then. Uh, to answer your question, uh, we take the standards from the bio. Uh, there the, are the, the, the many standards, uh, and actually, I, I more or less tell, well, Hans in this case, to implement these checks through his pipes. His, 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 his uh, pipe. I, I get the as a security officer, it makes my uh, life easier to to get proof of all the nor the standards he has been checking. Let, let's say 42 Crunch also gives me a sort of a report that all the OWASP guidelines and other guidelines we put in are all checked. And that is the proof we have. And that's what, what I'm, I'm uh, well, interested in as a security officer, that I get the proof, the governance, that all is taken care of and we trust our API to be published. Is, it, is this... An answer yeah, well, to your question, maybe? But yeah, just to explain, this is a, a, a platform and it's about security, but it's about generic security principles. We are no, not doing some kind of an assessment of an individual application, what actual controls need to be in place for a specific application. That, but also if, uh, as a user of the platform, uh, you do a security assessment, maybe 80% of your specific risks are already addressed by the platform. So you can focus on the 20% that is specific for your implementation. Okay, um, leave it uh, up there. Uh, you know to f where to find each other on a Friday afternoon uh, yeah, drink, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve. Uh, I do have one question, though. Um, uh, personal interest, actually. Um, there are many government agencies uh, in, in the Netherlands who need to apply to the bio guidelines. I think, but I'm not 100% sure, that Logius is actually the first who made it such far uh, and uh, in this way implemented in the whole CICD stack and, and, and with APIs. So the question is, is can this be uh, uh, repeated easily? Can it be copied to other government it's not Agency. patent, so if you want to uh, uh, apply it in uh, Yenlo Connect or something, uh, I think so we can talk Dutch about it. The Dutch government will contribute this to the open source community and also, free to use. Also, Logius has plans to open source uh, all their, uh, let's say, their... their the GitLab libraries. That sounds awesome. 
Well, yeah, thank it's, you for it's that. Paid, paid by the taxpayers, so if uh, other people can make use of it. I know there are that's, other that's, uh, agencies here that might be interested. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, Re return on tax, I would call it. Marcel, uh, I know you are so oh, ships. I know you are not speaking, but um, wants to go hand, hand over a gift. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and to uh, share this information with us. Thank you. Hans, thank you so much. And uh, we know where to find you. So uh, if you have any problem with your uh, DigiDay, you can call Hans. He will fix it for you.